my name is Brian Dinahan. I'm with Clark. Uh, here to talk in this afternoon about what happened down in Miami uh, during the Zika virus outbreak there and how the task force to go out there and control that. And then I'm also going to talk about, for those of you that are here today, to learn how to start your own program. That's the other thing that Dr. Gary wanted me to talk about, how you can think about starting your own program if you don't have one, if it's something that you're looking to, to get into. So what we'll talk about here with West Nile Leverage as we begin, think about you know, the, the different things. You know, if you're going to start a program, how Zika has changed things. Uh, but as Dr. Gary and Leanne and others have said, uh, Zika, the chances of it happening and having an outbreak here in Ohio are probably uh, more slim than none. But we do know that we're going to have nuisance mosquitoes. We do know that we will have West Nile virus. We do know that we will have lacrosse cases. So keep that in mind. So think about Zika and how you may be able to fine tune and adjust your programs if it were to take place. But also let's not forget about the basics of mosquito control that we know will take place this summer. So when we think about Zika, we're not going to be really recreating the wheel. We're still going to use our traditional techniques, but we're going to add a couple different things and maybe do things a little bit differently because of the, how the disease is different, which we've already talked about a little bit today. The one positive, if there can be such a positive thing with a mosquito-borne disease outbreak, is that it's brought a lot of attention to mosquito control, which is important. All the work that you in this room do is very important to your communities, the people that you serve. So by bringing attention to it is a good thing because whether it is Zika that ever makes its way to Ohio, uh, or if it's West Nile, it has another outbreak as we had in Dallas, Texas in 2012, or what's the next mosquito-borne disease? Uh, that's the one thing that we know is that these diseases are not going to go away. And this, the other thing Zika taught us is that we may need to adjust our very traditional programs and maybe fine tune that and do some things a little different to control that outbreak. The reason that we are here today and why we talk about mosquitoes is that mosquitoes actually kill more human beings on a yearly basis than any other creature on the face of the earth. We may hear about shark attacks in Florida this year or Australia and everything else, <laughs> other insects and animals on earth. But the only other thing that will kill more human beings on a yearly basis are human beings. And that happens during times of war. If not, it's mosquitoes. Mosquitoes kill about a million people or more every single year, year in and year out. So the work that we do here in the United States that many people may take for granted, the work that you do, is extremely important to your communities. So when we're thinking about Zika, we don't want to panic. Uh, a lot of that happened last year with some people, they were panicking, they were saying, oh my gosh, Zika's coming, what's going to happen? We don't want to do that. We want to simply take what we're going to learn here today, what we learned the past year, what we will continue to learn, and just implement that into our program. So we want to plan and prepare. We don't want to panic for the future. We don't want to do that for sure. The one thing that we do know is that Zika did change everything. Uh, Dr. Gary talked about that, that microcephaly of, of children is, is devastating. Uh, that's something that we haven't seen in any other disease, and that has really made an impact upon us, and it will continue to make an impact. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll show you a video here uh, that was put together to give you a quick summary of what happened down in Miami, and then we'll talk in a little bit more detail about that outbreak in Miami and how it was controlled. Without further ado. In the last weeks of 2015, news of a new mosquito-borne disease began to make headlines in the United States. The Zika virus, transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, was rapidly spreading in South and Central America, with tragic consequences. But unlike other mosquito-borne diseases, the Zika virus posed unique challenges to public health. The Aedes mosquito that carries the virus likes to breed in tiny containers, as small as a bottle cap. They prefer to live near people and are known as backyard breeders. As travel-related cases started to spread in the U.S., public health officials began to focus their attention on Florida as a likely site for local Zika transmission. On February 3, 2016, Florida Governor Rick Scott declared a state of emergency. Local officials were concerned with preventing the spread of the disease to its most vulnerable population, as well as the potentially devastating impact to tourism. In May, Miami-Dade County, with the support of the CDC and state officials, 
activated an emergency contingency contract with Clark, a national mosquito control products and service provider. Working with Miami-Dade County Mosquito Control and the CDC, Clark responded to the situation with an intensive program tailored for the site-centric challenges of controlling Hades mosquitoes. We went from a handful of crews going out each day to having to put 40 plus crews on the street each day. And as a private contractor, Clark was able to go out and recruit and then train and get that many people out and in the field. And that was so critical to help stopping this transmission. Known as SiteGuard, this program focused on two-person teams executing door-to-door -door inspections, applications, and resident education deployed to areas where confirmed cases were reported. This boots-on-the-ground program was integrated with the county's traditional surveillance and control measures, including larviciding and adulticiding. Then on July 29, 2016, the first locally acquired case of Zika virus was identified in the Wynwood neighborhood of Miami prompting health officials to escalate mosquito control response. The unique biology and behavior of Aedes mosquitoes had prompted the need to innovate. To quickly suppress the Aedes populations, Clark partnered with Dynamic Aviation and Valent Biosciences to configure a fixed-wing plane capable of making aerial larvicide treatments, which were alternated with adulticide aerial applications. As the concentrated efforts on the Wynwood neighborhood continued, Zika was discovered in Miami Beach, a premier international tourist destination. Clark immediately expanded the door-to-door -door site guard protocol, surveillance, ground inspections, and larvicide. However, aerial applications were met with public opposition, which again created a need for application innovation. Clark engineers quickly adapted powerful buffalo turbine blowers to propel larvicide into backyards and hard-to-reach mosquito breeding sites. The buffalo turbines were used to effectively treat entire neighborhoods, while ground crews focused on applications within an eighth of a mile of reported cases. Throughout the operation, Clark established and maintained an operation headquarters where crews were trained, equipped, and deployed. The ramp up was, was incredible. Um, we, we screened, hired, and trained over 161 people in just 42 days. That meant for over three months, we had 45 two-person crews working seven days a week. There are a lot of moving parts. Each afternoon, we would receive a few maps from the county of cases. The next morning at 6.30, we would deploy our team of 45 out into the field to perform door-to-door -door inspections and eighth of a mile around the confirmed Zika cases. Crews recorded all inspections and treatments on handheld devices. As they did, supervisors from both Clark and Miami-Dade could access the real-time information via a live web link and could redirect or redeploy teams as needed. In addition, the Clark Mobile Response Unit was on-site, serving as a mobile lab. By September 19, 2016, the Zika operation in Wynwood was deemed successful, and the CDC lifted its travel advisory for that area. Three months later, the travel advisory for Miami Beach was lifted as well. In all, approximately 213 Florida residents contracted the disease locally in 2016. While most locally transmitted cases centered in the Miami area, other Florida counties took cues from Miami-Dade and implemented aggressive steps to prevent local outbreaks. Clark worked with several Florida counties to distribute Z-Kits, which included blister packs of small natural larvicide tablets for homeowners and city yards. Over the years, outbreaks of mosquito-borne diseases here and around the world have helped shape and define how we address these public health challenges. With the world becoming increasingly interconnected, we have to expect we'll see more vector-borne diseases. Planning and preparedness have never been more important. While we may not know what we'll face in the future, you can be confident that the mosquito control industry will rise to the challenge. Okay, so that's a pretty good uh, video there to summarize what happened. And again, so when we talk about Zika virus, Dr. Garrett already talked about that. Sometimes the diseases aren't new to the industry, they're just new to a certain region. Uh, as he mentioned, it was first found in Uganda in 1947. People were actually looking for yellow fever at that time, and they found a new virus. And since they were looking for it in the Zika forest, 
they decide to, to name it the Zika virus. So they're very, very ingenious when they think about naming their diseases. Sort of like me and my son. I'm Brian. My son is, hmm, what's a good name? Brian. So a little bit more of what happened down there in, in Miami and what happened in the United States. So last year, there were over 4,900 confirmed cases in the United States. Most of those were travel cases. And we had those in Ohio where people went to an infected area, they came back with the disease and brought the Zika disease back with them here to Ohio. We didn't have any local transmission. All the local transmission cases happened in Florida. Most of those were in Miami. Uh, we did have a lot of pregnancies that are being followed nationwide by the CDC. Uh, almost 1,300, in fact, it's actually higher than 1,300 now. Uh, over 875 have given birth. 36 of those children have been known to have birth defects, such as microcephaly. Five of those pregnancies resulted in death, whether it was through uh, you know, canceling that pregnancy, the mother's choice, or other reasons. So that is something that is a concern which we talked about. It's microcephaly which is really bringing a lot of attention to this disease, and justifiably so. The other reason, and Dr. Berry touched on this, is the different routes of transmission. Usually when we think about a mosquito-borne disease, you have to get bitten by a mosquito. That's not the case with the Zika virus. Not only do we have the blood transfusion that is occurring, but it's the mother giving it to the child, the unborn baby getting that disease. We've never seen that before. The other one, obviously, is that sexual transmission that we talked about. Uh, and me, on my own personal basis, it's the sexual transmission that means a lot to me because if my wife has any other reason not to have sex with me again, I don't need that anymore. I was down in Miami for one week and it's been nine months. I'm like, come on, honey, let's go. So that one's very disturbing. And as we talked about, if the two vectors are Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, they're artificial containers. They breed in these very small areas of amounts of water. The biggest thing is that they like to live and feed where we live, work, and play. That's where these mosquitoes are found. In fact, in the Zika conference that had about 400 to 500 people uh, down in Kentucky last week in Lexington, uh, Dr. Grayson Brown, who does a lot of the surveillance in Kentucky, said that 86% of the mosquito bites that people receive in Fayette County, Lexington, Kentucky, are from Aedes albopictus, which simply means if you're getting bit, you are the ones breeding those mosquitoes. As Leanne and others talked about, they have a very short flight radius. You know, maybe a block or two, and that's the that's the high end. So if they're feeding on you, look around your own backyard. In fact, when you leave here today, walk around your property. You'll be surprised how many breeding sites that you'll find, and what you can do to try to, you know, eliminate those sites. So the other thing we learned is that we're going to use our traditional techniques, doing, you know, wide area techniques, but we have to also be site sensitive. We have to get boots on the ground to look for where those containers are because they are there to be in everyone's backyard. When we were down there, I knocked on every door and said, can we have access to your backyard so we can walk around and try to find some breeding sites? And we did. At every single, every single property that we had access to, we found breeding sites, whether it's in a bottle cap or a paint cap or a tarp, you name it. You'd be surprised how much water is around our own houses. So what we did is where, where that Zika case was at, there was a one eight mile radius around there. The maps were out, our technicians went, they went and knocked on every single door and said, can we have access to your backyard? We're here for Zika with Miami-Dade. We'd like to help control the mosquitoes. And we were granted, I was only not granted access twice in the week I was down there. Only two people did not allow us access to their backyard. So everyone is very, very accommodating if that were to happen in your area. That's a question that's come up a few times. Again, Dr. Gary talked about that it's all these cryptic sites, all these very small breeding sites that are going to be the challenge for you. It's not the traditional large areas of woodland swamps and roadside ditches that you normally treat. It's gonna be all these very small, tiny areas that you're going to have to go and look for to find out where those mosquitoes are. Great thing is to use gravity. If you can, you know, dip some, dump, dump some of these things over and eliminate that breeding site. But if not, if you think that site's gonna breed when you leave, make sure you treat it before you leave as well. So some of the services that were put on there, what they came up with, as they mentioned in the video, called Site Guard, where they use surveillance, treatment, inspection, and education. Here's a nice timeline of what happened. As they said, in February, the governor thought that 
you know, if something's going to happen, it's probably going to happen in my state of Florida. And Miami's probably a good place for it with all the, the travel from all of our Hispanic population back down to Cuba and Puerto Rico and so forth. And Puerto Rico had a huge outbreak of the Zika virus. So he was thinking that was something that was going to take place. So as they started to ramp that up, we had the first two-person crew on the ground in May, just preparing that if something were to happen. Then we saw an increase in the travel cases, so we increased that crew. Then we had that first local transmission, and then we had to put a lot of boots on the ground. And then from July through the end of the year, we had about 150 to 180 people working seven days a week. So it was pretty intensive there down in Miami for quite a long period of time. So we talked about that in the video. We had to hire 161 people in just over 40 days. Uh, that's a pretty difficult task because you have to interview all these people. We had to make sure one of the things that we had on our application is, why do you want to do this? We wanted to make sure that they are, are very passionate like you are. We wanted them to know that either they want to help their community, they want to control the disease, they want to make things better for people and for the earth. They had to check one of those boxes. They had to give us a reason why they wanted to work for us. Then after that, we had to do the background checks. If they passed all the background checks, then we had to train them. We had to do all that training so we could get them on the street to go out there and control that disease. An example of that crew, so we just had a very small crew, and then we had a room full, and just over a month we went to over 180 people. So a pretty difficult challenge. And it really put a lot of pressure on our human resources department to get that task done, because we needed that many people. So that's something to consider. If Zika were to hit your area, how are you going to respond? Can you do that hiring? Can you do that and get that many people out in the streets? And the reason is, again, it's everywhere where we live, work, and play. The other thing that we find, and this is not just unique to Miami, is new construction. There's a lot of construction out there. All of those construction sites have a lot of artificial containers which is where these two mosquitoes, the yellow pictus and Egypti, love to breed in. So we're creating these new habitats. Where we're creating these new homes or entertainment areas for us, we're bringing the mosquitoes right to us. There's a picture of that fixed wing aircraft. When we, this is the one for the larva siding. You can see the many nozzles here. That's one that's gonna do the area larva siding that was done in Miami. There's a picture of that, and here you'll see the video and they're really coming really close to the ground. That plane is about 150 feet or so above the ground. It's being done during the daytime, so you're not gonna hide from people. They are going to see you, you're going to be out there, and that's a lot of liquid product that you're putting out. But it's very effective when you're dealing with the Zika virus because you need that liquid product to get into all those artificial containers to help control that disease. Because when we were down knocking on everyone's doors, as you can imagine, there's a lot of people that aren't home during the day. They're working. Yes, Andrew? What kind of liquid larvicide did you guys use? The liquid larvicide was Vectobac, it was BTI. It was the, it was the Vectobac uh, WDG. We didn't use the liquid, we used the powder, and then we mixed it. So this is the map to show you where we were able to do that area of larvicide from the aircraft. However, we ran into a difficult situation when it moved this, the Zika virus over to the South Beach area. That's when there was a lot of pushback because they first wanted to do the adult application, which had a lot of pushback, and then that translated into saying, no, we just don't want any aircraft flying over Miami Beach just because of the tourist area that it is. And so we had to think of something different. We had to do it quickly, and that's when we came up with this buffalo turbine, something that we never used in the industry before. So we had this tur buffalo turbine, we actually called Buffalo Turbine and said, can you get us one? And they said, yeah, sure, you know, we don't have any right now, but we'll assemble one, you'll have it in about three weeks. Three weeks? <laughs> we don't have three weeks. Can you send us one with the directions and we can assemble it? So they did, they sent us the Buffalo Turbines, they sent us about two or three, we assembled them ourselves, and then they started to assemble them and send, and send us more. So we put this together, put the liquid larvicide in here, there's a video there that will show you how quickly that that get, gets up in the air. It'll get about 100 feet or so in the air, and then we're gonna get at least 200 feet of coverage from that buffalo turbine. So that was very effective for us to help control that outbreak of the disease in the Miami Beach area where we could not fly our aircraft, which was difficult because when you're in an aircraft, you can cover a huge area, and then all of a sudden it's down to nothing. So how do we do that? 
the Buffalo Turbine was really a good tool for us in that. Data and reporting was also very important. Uh, we actually had two handheld devices that we had to use, one that Miami Dade gave us and one that we at Clark had to get reporting to give back to Miami Dade. So we had to take a picture of every single address, the GPS coordinates would come up, if it was incorrect, you had to change it, take pictures of the habitats you found around that perimeter, and then total the amount of product that you used to treat every single site that you saw. So a lot of data, a lot of reporting, a lot of data that we captured, which, which was important for us as well. If you zoomed in there, you can see, you know, you couldn't get access to every single house. Some people were home, a lot of people aren't home. So that was important too, you know, what were we treating, what were we not? It was just under about 50% of the, of the homes that you could get access to. So what did we learn? We learned that you need season-long control. You need products that were used that provided at least 30 days of control to stop the spread of that Zika virus. We continued to do all of our traditional techniques, but again, we brought it site-centric. We, we used gravity in our favor. We knocked on doors to find out where these breeding sites are and how we can control them. We need to understand that it's people. People spread this disease. As Dr. Gary said, we're the reservoir. It's different than other, other diseases. So we're the ones that are going to spread it to other mosquitoes and keep that transmission alive. So we need to know that with people and educate people in that regard. Because it's everywhere where we live, work, and play. This is a great tourist area uh, down in the Miami Beach area. And you see people walking around in a great art gallery, stopping and having food. And they have these plants called bromeliads down in Florida, which I had never heard of, that hold water and breed mosquitoes for us. So it's not like a traditional plant that you water and it doesn't hold water. These leaves hold all kinds of water and the mosquitoes breed right in there. The new, the new larva cycle that took place that was important for us. That buffalo turbine, if you can use your aircraft, that's the best, best case scenario. Because that aircraft is going to give you that canopy control from the top down. You're going to control a much wider area. But if you can't, using a, a new technique, that ground technique, is very important for us. The door-to-door -door inspections are very important. You need to get people in boots on the ground to go there and inspect each site, each habitat, as often as you can. The other thing that we learned that we're doing different this year than last year. So again, these techniques are going to continue to change, continue to evolve, as we learn more about this disease. As Dr. Gary said, at first we didn't think Zika was going to be anything. It ended up being very, very devastating. So last, last year, we did a one-eighth mile radius. This year what we're doing is just a one block area where there's a Zika case. Because we find that these mosquitoes that don't travel that far are usually just deterred by the street for some reason. So we'll do very centric, very close not door knocking in just a block area, and then we're expanding our traditional area-wide control around that one block area. If you're gonna have people, if this happens to you, you have to have your people identifiable. Each one of our employees had a gray, gray long sleeve t-shirt on, a badge, a hat, and a vest. Because you, when you're knocking on somebody's door, then we step back so they could see us, so we were identifiable, had our badge and said, we're here with Miami-Dade for Zika control. Do you mind if we have access to your property, ma'am or sir? And as I said, in most cases they do, but you better make sure that your people are identifiable out there when you're knocking on someone's door asking to have access to the backyard. Your trucks have to be marked properly as well. Most of you guys are. But every single one of our trucks, we made sure it said Miami-Dade on there. You need to know who you're working for and what you're doing. Everyone has to have the same tools. Every single one of our crews had all the larva siding tools that were needed and the adult siding tools that were needed. Some of you probably remember this, Andrew and Phil, you guys remember that old P1. Well, that one is no longer available for sale in the United States. We have a different one that we'll share with you later. Uh, but we actually had to buy these back from our old, our distributor down in Mexico. And he was very kind. He only marked it up 200% back to us to sell it back to us. He's great. <laughs> So innovations are very important. Uh, you need to use a, a long-lasting residual larvicide. In Miami, they used these three larvicides, which we'll talk about later. And then here's a video of that buffalo turbine. And this one will extend at the end. And if you watch here at the end, not only is it throwing that liquid product about 100 feet in the air, but this is driven hydraulically. So there's an alley right over here that we know is coming up, and you'll see this bend 
and push that product right down the alley to an area we want to treat. See, it's bent right there at the end to distribute that product to more artificial containers for us. So it's a very nice tool that was used down to control that outbreak. Again, what? yes, Phil. So the question was, and you could hear at the back is, with Miami's nightlife, did they have to change things? Were businesses and bars shut down earlier for us to perform that task? Uh, no. And the reason, that's a good question, the reason that we had to use that versus the airplanes is Miami Beach pretty much runs 23 hours a day. Around 6 o'clock in the morning, some places are opening for breakfast, people are out jogging, they're grabbing their spots on the beach with their chairs and their towels. It continues throughout the day, and all the liquor licenses in Miami Beach go till 5 a.m. So we had about 60 to 30 minute window to do our buffalo turbines and control those artificial containers on the street. So it took a long time to control all the area in Miami Beach, but they did not change anything in Miami Beach. We only had about a 30 to 60 minute window to do that work. And you're only driving that, that truck at about a five mile an hour rate. You saw how slow that truck was going. So, you know, within that 30 or 60 minutes, we had, we could only cover two and a half to five miles at the most. So it was difficult and it did take some time. That's a good question. And then, so this slide, so Dr. Gary talked about this, why Zika is different with West Nile virus and other diseases. If we get bitten, we're what's called a dead end host, meaning we cannot transmit that disease. Zika is very different, as is chicken gun, chikungunya and, and dengue. We are the host, so if we have this disease, which is why travel cases are recorded and reported, is that that's how you can get now imported cases. Because we have the disease, a mosquito in the area bites us, and goes to our neighbor's yard or buys it, bites another member of our family, and then the disease amplifies from there. So they're different, we talked about it, they're artificial containers. They breed in any small thing that's going to hold water for you. All of that needs to be checked. They like to live and breed where we live, work, and play. And they're opposite of most of the mosquitoes out there that are vampires that feed during the nighttime. These two mosquitoes, the Aedes albopictus and Aegypti, feed during the day. So they're very different in that regard. So they feed between dawn and dusk. Most mosquitoes will feed between dusk and dawn. So very different for those two mosquitoes as well. You've seen this slide about where the Egypti and Elbopictus are. The other reason why it was important in Miami is there's, in the Miami-Dade metropolitan area, there's about 2.7 million people in that area. So what does that mean for us? Well, in Ohio, we have some very large metropolitan areas as well. Here, when you include the Akron, Canton, Cleveland area, there's over three and a half million people. Just in the Cleveland, greater Cleveland area alone, there's over two million. Columbus, over two million. Dayton, almost 800,000. Cincinnati, over two million. So there's a lot of population where we have these urban and suburban areas too, that it's possible. This is not meant to tell you the sky is falling. This is meant to tell you why we're here, why the state has put on these eight Zika conferences for us to be concerned about. You want to engage the public. One of the great tools they talked about in the video is that many of the surrounding communities, not only in Miami and Dade, but the surrounding counties, use this kit to get people helping us in the fight against the Zika mosquito. So people would come into their local municipalities or local health departments, grab one of these tablets, one of these sheets, and bring that back so they can go out into their own backyard and help us control the mosquitoes themselves. So that's what that 12 tablet sheet looks like. And you can see, it's a very small tablet that's smaller than the size of a dime. And yet this tablet will last for 60 days or more in water. It was actually originally designed on the international market where they don't have plumbing and running water as we do. So one of these tablets was meant to be put into a 55 gallon drum and it would control the water that people use for drinking water in third world countries for 60 days. So if you're putting it into a 55 gallon drum or a smaller container, it's going to last for 60 days and possibly even more for you. So it was a very good tool that was used down in Miami-Dade. But as we said, we don't want to think about just Zika virus. What we know we're going to deal with this year, we're going to deal with West Nile virus. It's going to be here in Ohio. How many cases we're going to have, how many people are going to perish from it, we don't know. But we will have it. And it's the Culex species, that, predominantly the Culex pipians, that is spreading that disease when it accidentally bites us humans and it is widespread throughout the United States. It is endemic. Endemic means that we will be dealing with it annually every single year. 
to go to show you, Zika got all the attention last year, but last year, just as similar to 2015, there was over 2,000 cases of West Nile virus nationwide. Most of those cases were centered in California, but here in Ohio, you know, we had 18 cases and four people died from it, from a mosquito bite. And our neighbors as well, they had many cases and they had, we had death as well. The epicenter was in California. So this is something that we will be dealing with this year. West Nile virus is definitely gonna be something that happens. Zika is something to be aware of. West Nile virus is gonna happen. Lacrosse as well, Dr. Gary already touched on this. And again, same thing like the Zika virus, it was first found in Lacrosse, Wisconsin. So they named it the Lacrosse virus. And this really affects mostly children. That 80s triceratus mosquito, it's kids that are out playing, they run into the shaded area to get their soccer ball, their baseball, they end up getting bitten by a mosquito, and it's very, very devastating. And there's a, a greater death rate with this than there even is with West Nile virus. So it's a pretty, pretty awful disease, especially when it affects children. It's the Eastern Tree Hole, the 80s triceratus, which I spoke about there. Here's that map that was originally found in Wisconsin, as Dr. Gary said. Uh, we lead the, the nation, but down there in the Appalachians in West Virginia and part of North Carolina and Tennessee, they're, they're seeing an increase in there as well. And uh, Andrew Deacon talked about this. He asked about malaria. Uh, that is the greatest killer worldwide. Uh, they, most people believe that these are the, the data stats that we uh, receive. We believe that that's underreported just because of the areas in Africa where it's very difficult to you know, collect that data accurately. So we believe it's many more cases and more than a million deaths every year. And in fact, some of the experts have told me that even though they say a child dies every 30 seconds, they think it might be every three seconds. They think it's that devastating. So the question was, Illinois seemed to have, I'll see if I can back up here, had more cases of West Nile virus than some of the neighboring states here in the Midwest. And the answer and the question to that is, do we know why? Uh, actually, no, we don't know why. It can, we, what we have seen with West Nile virus is that it can, it can peak and then go back into a valley from year to year. Uh, as Dr. Gary said, we had you know, large outbreaks here for a few years in Ohio, then it went down. Then we had another large outbreak in 2012, and it's been down for a couple of years. So it can change from state to state, from area to area. So they may have just had a, uh, you know, better weather, better conditions in Illinois than they had in, in Ohio last year. Same thing with Michigan, just to the north of us. So a good question, but there is no concrete data as to why that happened. So Leanne and Dr. Gary talked about this. When you're dealing with the mosquito, you need to know your enemy before you can come, uh, you know, go to battle against it. So you have the adult mosquito, then it lays their eggs. Then there's the pupil stage. There's four different instars there. Excuse me, that, that's the instar, the larval stage. Then the pupil stage, then that adult mosquito once again. There's that uh, the, inst the larval stage, as Dr. Gary talked about. They have these, these, these tubes here that will pierce the surface of the water. So even though we need water, for development, if you don't have water, you're not going to have mosquitoes. The mosquitoes actually still need to breathe air. So they're going to pick those habitats that Dr. Gary talked about that are very still water so they can actually attach to the surface of the water and breathe their air. Then when they move into the pupil stage, as he said, that's a non-feeding resting stage, but they still have those trumpets where they still need to breathe air. And as he said, they actually are moving in this stage, which is very unique to the insect world. And they'll move to avoid their predators. They're called tumblers in this stage. Then lastly, you have the adult mosquito. Uh, this adult mosquito will actually wait for the weather conditions to be perfect. Once that weather conditions are perfect, it will emerge from that pupil case. It'll take a few minutes to emerge from the pupil case, and then that adult mosquito will, will rest upon the surface of the water for about 30 to 60 minutes, allowing its exoskeleton to harden, and then it will fly to a harborage area. And usually the male mosquitoes will emerge about a day or two before the females will emerge. And once they emerge, they will fly to these harborage areas. There they are flying. Anybody know what that sound is? Some of you have heard that before. That aircraft there is called a mosquito. It's a World War II airplane that was from Great Britain. So that's how we put that sound in there. So the the males and females will go to these harborage areas, they'll go into their mating frenzy. After that, it is the female mosquito only that goes out in search of that blood meal. And she'll take in as much blood as she can to make her eggs viable for depositing. Next thing I want to show you about is how difficult it really is for mosquito-borne diseases to make it to us. It's a very 
difficult task for this female mosquito as she's feeding on us. She's going to take in as much blood as she can. She'll become so engorged that she'll actually increase her body weight like two to three times what she originally weighed. But for disease transmission to take place, it's a very tedious task and it's very fragile how it takes place. So this female mosquito will land on us. She'll bring back her protective sheet and her needle will come in here looking to feed on that blood meal. As she feeds on the blood meal, if her host has some virus in her, she will bring in some of that virus with that blood meal that she's taking in. If she takes in, as she takes in that virus, if there is virus, that will now be digested through the blood. <coughs> After it digests through the blood, some of that virus will have to survive within the female mosquito. If it survives that stage, now it has to replicate enough within the female mosquito. Once it replicates, it has to start to disseminate into different tissues of the mosquito, of the female mosquito. And the one it has to make it to, which is important for us, some of it has to make it to the salivary glands. The reason for that is when we talk about a mosquito bite, it's actually not a bite. She has little saws, little scissors that saw into us so her needle can probe and look for that blood meal. And while she's sawing, she's actually injecting an anticoagulant to us. So it's from her salivary glands, so our blood won't clot. So she can actually bring in that blood meal for her. So as she goes through that, you have to have enough blood and enough logs of the virus to make it for transmission. So now she lands on us. She has enough of the virus in her salivary glands. Okay, so as she's biting us here, what happened, and I must have went a little too quickly here, See if it will slowly work here. When she, when the female mosquito lands on us and bites us, some of that virus from her salivary glands has to make it into us. Here's a video showing you. This is the female mosquito. She lands on us. Look how small her abdomen is here. It's going to become very engorged. So as she pierces us, looking for that blood meal, she injects that anticoagulant. And when you think of a needle, you think of it being straight, like a sewing needle. It's not. Her needle will actually bend, looking for this blood vessel. And if you watch here, as she finds that blood vessel, look how small this blood vessel is going to shrink. Once she finds that blood meal and she taps it, she's like, oh, there it is. <clears throat> Down to nothing. Anybody feel itchy? So she's going to drink in as much blood as she can. She's going to keep bringing in that blood to make as many eggs as she can. The more blood she brings in, the more eggs she can lay. And it's going to go back to showing that, that female landing on us while she's taking this blood meal. Look how engorged she is now, even so much so that she's defecating on us there. So she's going to eject some of her fluids to bring in more blood. So she brings in that blood, she's increased in size, and she flies away. So that's a lot that has to take place for the disease transmission. Plus, when she's on us, she has to make sure that we don't smack her and stop that disease transmission ourselves. So it's a pretty complicated task of what takes place there. Habits, any place that holds water around your area is what you need to look for. If you're looking to start a program, start out looking in your area as to where you are going to find water and what you need to treat. Those are the areas where mosquitoes will be breeding for you. So whether it's around a home, retention ponds, detention ponds, around schools, you name it. Those are places, anything that's going to hold water for you. If you're looking for areas for Zika, it's going to be around the home. It's these artificial containers, and if they're breeding, you're the one that's feeding them. It's right around your house. Dr. Gary talked about these woodland pools. Uh, these are great, especially in the spring and early summer. We have, we've had a lot of rainfall. These will have a lot of the floodwater mosquitoes will hatch off for us. Some of these will dry up in the summer, some of them won't. Roadside ditches are great. He talked about that. Uh, these will continue to hold water for us. Great breeding site for the Culex mosquito, which is that vector of the West Nile virus for us. This is a nice flood penny. And you can see right in the picture on the top there, look at all those homes in the background just about 50 yards away from this floodplain. So you have a low-lying area, holds water for us. That 80s mosquito will lay their eggs there. And then all of a sudden they'll go and feed on us. The catch basins. Dr. Gary talked about this too, how this is a great habitat for that West Nile virus mosquito. They actually love to lay their eggs in there. 
and we had those catch basins everywhere, just holding water for us all summer long. So container breeding sites, anything that's an artificial container is important when you're thinking about Zika. Whether it's the flower pots, you can see a couple egg grafts down there. Whether it's a bottle cap, uh, I've been doing this for 18 years, starting with Clark back at the end of 99, and I've heard, always heard stories about, oh, mosquitoes can breed in bottle caps. Never did I see it until I worked down in Miami this year, and they will. It's that smallest area of water that you have to look for if you're doing your Zika control, looking for their habitats. You would be surprised where mosquitoes can breed, and they will breed there. Tires, we've talked about this for many, many years in the industry. And the joke that I always make, and a few of you have heard this before, so I apologize, is I don't know how the water gets into a tire. Would you ever try to get water out of a tire? Well, you better wear an apron, man, because that water's gonna get all over you, and you still won't get it all out of there. So it's very difficult, but it's a great breeding habitat, as Dr. Gary said. And that's actually how the 80s Elbopictus and Egypti mosquito came into the United States, was through tires. Tree holes, that's the 80s Triceratus for the lacrosse. All these artificial containers are all around the home. All of them are right around the home. The bird baths, the five gallon bucket. You know you've got that five gallon bucket laying around your home today when you walk around, you'll see it. Dump that five gallon bucket over. And if you have it tipped over, sometimes it's that rim on the outside, it's gonna hold water for you too. You've done some landscaping, you got the wheelbarrow, you didn't put it back in the garage or the shed where it belongs, so it's holding water. There's that cooler from Ohio State, Michigan last year. It kept, kept it out in the backyard. Breeding water for you, you better dump it. Wait till next November, okay? Rain gutters. This is the one thing we've had a lot of questions on that. Did we check the rain gutters down in Miami? No, we did not. We could not bring a ladder and put something against someone's home to risk liability and, and breaking someone's property. But you know this happens. You'll go home, we'll have the next rainfall later this week, you'll see the water flowing over your gutter, and you'll say, ah, oh, man, I gotta get up there and clean those gutters. And the next day it's sunny and dry, and you're like, Psh, I'll get to that next week. And that's how your gutters look, and they're sitting there breeding mosquitoes for you. So that's a very important thing, and the message to get out is to clean those gutters. Let that water flow. Kid pools, just dump that stuff. Surveying and mapping. If you're starting your program, it's very important to know where your habitats are. Define those sources, because it's very important to know what you're treating and how you're going to treat it. Is it a breeding site? One of the great stories I've heard from Joel Lynch from Cuyahoga County is he'll go out to a lot of sites holding water, and he'll say, oh man, that site is gonna be horrible, I'm gonna have to treat that. He'll go out there, he'll take a dip, no mosquitoes. There's enough natural predators there that he doesn't have to treat that area. So find out, is your site a breeding site or not? Label it. If it's not a breeding site, you put it off. And go back there and check it a month later. If it's breeding, treat it then and there. You know, And it's very good for your acres and your miles for your budgeting process. If you know what you're going to treat and how long it's going to take and what you're going to use, that will help you with your budget. Miami Dade, that was very important. As I said, we had two handheld devices tracking everything that was done. You had to know where you were at, what house where you're at, and recorded how much product you used. So all of that data was accumulated for us on a daily basis and a weekly basis. Very important for your surveillance. The other thing that's very good, whether or not we had access, we always dropped off a door tag. Hey, this is what you need to do. When we're gone, don't forget about it. Please continue to work. Please continue to monitor your backyard, your area. Get rid of that standing water. Some of the other surveillance that you can do as professionals, whether you're doing larval surveillance or adult surveillance. If you're doing larval surveillance, you can know whether that habitat, as I said, is breeding or not breeding. Very difficult to know what the species is in the larval stage. Some people can do it. I'm not very good at it. I've been trained a few times, but that's a difficult thing to do. It's easier to do it in the adult stage. In fact, Jake will talk about that from Toledo here shortly. This is a very a nice video here. You'll see how quickly a swimming pool can become a breeding habitat for us. If you look at the swimming pool, you'll be able to see right to the bottom. Just a little bit of algae is formed. Somehow that filter was turned off on that pool for maybe a week, and all of a sudden it's a big breeding habitat for mosquitoes. So this pool can be restored within a couple of days. You can see to the bottom, there's a little bit of algae. Our technician comes to the side. Look at that. That's how quickly it can happen. You let that pool go just for a week and turn that filter off. Those are all pupae and a bunch of larvae in that pool. 
All they need to do is turn that filter on, put a little shotgun next to them, cool, clean it up, and all that disappears. But it can happen that fast. As Dr. Gary said, they can go through their life cycle in about seven to 10 days in the summer. Adult surveillance, Leanne has talked about all of these different traps that you can use, whether you're using a CO2 baited light trap, which uses carbon dioxide and light as the attractant. You can use your gravit traps. These are great, as she talked about, for West Nile virus surveillance. The first trap, the ABC trap, is, it, is looking for that female, female mosquito that wants a blood meal. The gravit trap, she's already fed on a blood meal looking for a place to lay her eggs. And she talked about the B&G Sentinel trap, and I'm glad she mentioned it. Usually takes about two weeks <laughs> for that thing to air out and get that plastic smell out before it starts working well for you. Lastly is the control. And why is control so important? Well, people know that most mosquitoes, as Dr. Gary said, pose little or no threat. Mostly nuisance for us. They ruin our outside activities. They bite us. We don't like it. Others can be killers and are a concern for us. And you know, we educate people. Let them know what to do. Protect yourselves. Stay away from mosquitoes. Wear a repellent when you need. But a lot of times they don't do it. They just don't listen. So it's so important what all of you in this room do or are going to do if you're starting a program. The reason I say this is it was a, a survey was taken in Massachusetts a few years ago where they have a lot of triple E. Dr. Gary talked about the Eastern equine encephalitis. And it has about a 35% mortality rate for human beings. And they were flying airplanes over areas of Massachusetts and then reporters went out there and said, excuse me, uh, you're out here uh, watching your kid's soccer game. Are you aware of the triple E that's in the area? Yes, yes we are. You know they're gonna be flying airplanes over? Yes, yes we are. You know that it's a very bad disease? Yes, I do. Are you protecting yourself? Are you off on it? Do you have long sleeve shirts? No, no, I don't have anything on it. So everyone is aware of these things and yet they still weren't protecting themselves. So the work that you do is very, very important. Larval control, where you find your breeding habitats at, where you have that water. There's many different products that you can use. Uh, as I said, a lot of times they're natural predators, as, as Joe Lynch from Cuyahoga County said. And you'll go to a site and you won't even need to do the larval, larval control and you thought you would. If not, there's different products that you can use. Dr. Gary talked about if they're in that pupil stage, which we just saw in that video from the swimming pool, then you have to use an oil or a surfactant to clog their siphons and control them. A larvicide does not work in the pupil stage. If you find them in the larval stage, you can use many different products. You can use your biological control agents, your insect growth regulators, or your spinosad, which is a spiny sugar. So there's different modes of action. IRAC stands for the Insecticide Resistant Action Committee, and that's really a different mode of action on how the product works on the larval mosquito. So there's a couple different tools in our toolbox at the larvicide stage. Your first one are your surfactants, your oils. These work both well in the larval and the pupil stage, but it's the only product that you can use if you do find pupae out in the environment. If you, get, if you go to one of those habitats and they're already in the pupil stage, you'll need your oil. The next one is your BTI. This is one of your bacteriums. It stands for Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. That's that liquid product that Andrew Deacon asked what we use down in Miami from the airplane. Uh, this works good in clean water. Uh, very quick kill, only lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. So timing is important when using a BTI. The next molecule that came out about 15 to 18 years ago with the onset of the West Nile virus was the Bacillus asparagus, the next generation of that bacillus molecule, that bacterium. And this really overcame some of the shortcomings of the BTI for us. It provided us with residual control, about 21 to 45 days, and worked very well in areas that were very dirty water, the organic water that the Culex mosquito loves to breed in. Other products came out a couple years ago combining both of those molecules, the BTI and the Spiracus, together. So that's something that some people are also using are both of those as well. Altacid, uh, this is more of your insect growth regulator, uses methaprene. I guess there's another one on the market as well to, for you to be aware of. Comes in many different formulations. What the insect growth regulators do are they actually stop that mosquito from becoming an adult. So it keeps it as a teenager. Never allows that person to become an adult. 
And then lastly, you have your spinosad. This is your spiny sugar. This again is another natural occurring bacterium in the environment. And these are the three different formulations that were again used down there in Miami. And that's that DT tablet. That's that one that will provide you 60 days that other communities are using as well. Any questions on larval control before we wrap it up here on the adult control, the last part of our section? Okay, on adult control, you can either do barrier or you can do your traditional truck mounted ULB. If you're doing a barrier, that's where you're putting out using a gas powered backpack. You're putting out a much larger droplet to vegetation to really stop mosquitoes from either infiltrating an area or, or leaving the area. So you're putting up a barrier. More traditional is when you're putting out that ULV spray. Uh, Leanne showed you a picture of that. I actually found out that, that picture was from a truck from New Philadelphia, Ohio. Just found that out today. But that's where you're putting out that fine aerosol mist from the back of the truck. Uh, that mist is, is uh, about 10 to 20 microns in size is what we want. And really that aerosol mist, like hairspray, is so fine that we can fit about 150 droplets across the head of a pin. And we do that, adult decided, because it's very effective. It's also the very first step that must be done when you're in a disease outbreak. When we have West Nile virus or Zika or another disease, it's the adult mosquito that's transmitting that disease. So that's when the adult applications must take place. Doesn't mean that we stop our surveillance or we stop our larvicide, not the case. We continue that but we have to do the adult control at that time to stop the spread of that disease. Whichever vendor you choose to purchase your products from, it's extremely important that when you're talking your adult control that your unit is properly calibrated and particle tested every year. That is language that is on the label. So whoever you choose to purchase your products from, make sure that they provide this calibration and particle testing for you. It's an annual requirement that has to be done on each part of your equipment. So when do you adult decide? Dr. Gary talked about this. Sometimes people will spray every week. Some will spray every other week. It's really good to use the data that he was talking about to decide when you're going to make that adult application. So there could be a couple different triggers that you use before you begin that adult application. Many times we'll use historical data. You know, we know that as the weather gets warmer, the days get longer, kids are out playing. Usually around Memorial Day, people will start those applications. When you have complaint calls, if you have a hotline where people can call in and inform you that there's a lot of mosquitoes in an area, you want to take those calls and use that as data as well. Usually we like to say you want at least two or more calls from a certain area. Because you don't want that Brian Dean man that calls and complains about everything. We always have those people, right? They call and complain about everything. So you want to eliminate that person. You want to at least justify that there's a, a few calls out there in a certain area. Monitor your weathering, your weather, your rainfall. You get that half inch or so of rain, you can bet that about seven to 10 days later, you're gonna get that hatch off of mosquitoes. So you can use that information to begin your adult application. Whether it's your traps, if you're out there collecting mosquitoes and traps, a lot of times a good number to start with is if you collect more than 25 mosquitoes in a trap per night, then you can get out there and start your adult application. That's a good indicator that you have a nuisance level and if you have a good nuisance program, you're gonna have a good disease program. Lastly is disease might be present. You might not have any of these, like if we're in a drought year, but you may send in some of your mosquitoes to Dr. Gary. He may come back and say, you know Stark County, you know Summit County, a lot of those traps came back positive for West Nile virus. So you may not have a lot of mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes that are out there could be very hot, ready to transmit disease. So these are just a couple ideas of some information and data you can use before you begin that adult application. This is the new machine that we will be using this year because we don't have that P1 available to us for Zika control, so that's something to be aware of. It's a gas-powered backpack that will produce true ULV droplets for us. More traditional, if you're looking for new pieces of equipment, I know there's been a lot of new equipment sold the past couple of years with the Ohio EPA grant. There is your electric machine. This is more stealthy. And then you have your more traditional gas powered units. One is just a little bit larger than the other. It has a larger blower and a larger engine. But all three machines are going to produce the same amount of droplets and give you the same efficacy 
and the control of the mosquitoes. Simply something to be aware of if you want something that's a little more sustainable and electric, or you want to use your traditional gas-powered machine if being quiet may matter to you or not. So that's something to think about. Whichever type of new machine you're looking for, you want to try to get the latest and greatest in technology. Most people will use a GPS receiver so you can have variable flow. Another thing that you may want to consider is what data will it record for you. It was talked about with the NPDES requirements. A lot of equipment out there will now have a piece of data recording on that machine that will record for you the amount of acres that you sprayed, the amount of miles that you sprayed, the amount of gallons that you used. As Leanne talked about, all of that is important information for NPDES requirements. So something to consider when you're looking for a new piece of equipment out there. And when you do your control, it's important to get uniform, complete coverage of your whole area. You want to drive every street east-west and north-south because that wind always shifts. When you stand outside, that wind pushes from one direction, then it goes to another. You want to eliminate as many variables as you can. So drive east-west, north-south, and get uniform, complete coverage of whatever area that you're going to go out there and control that evening. Very important. There's many different products, that, again, that you can use on the market. Whether you're purchasing from myself or one of my competitors that are different vendors out there, there's a lot of different products that are out there. Just make sure what you're using is registered by the Ohio EPA and the US EPA. Make sure it's registered here in the state for use. But there's a lot of products you can use out there. They fall into two different categories, whether it's an organophosphate or your synthetic man-made. These are just, again, now in this one, we only have two different modes of action. So we don't have as many tools in the toolbox for our health control. Your organophosphates, most of them now are ready to use. They're not near as corrosive as they used to be, and they're very good rotational products for us. Your pyrethroids are a little bit more synthetic. They're more man-made. They work well in all temperatures for us. Again, what now, if you're dealing with West Nile virus or a regular nuisance control, it's a different controls, more of your traditional or your nighttime applications. Uh, the one thing, as we talked about, the Culex mosquito is a very tough mosquito. Likes to breed in that dirty, stinky, organic water. So it comes out tough and mean. It's from the street, it's from the back alley. So you might need to have an increased flow rate if you're dealing with disease than with, with regular nuisance control. But almost all of your traditional products will work effectively on that mosquito. But you just want to make sure you're putting out the proper dosage to get that kill of that female Culex. If you're dealing with Zika, as we know, these are daytime biters. They feed during different times. So if you're going to do your nighttime traditional control, it's important to use a product that has an agitator or a flushing agent to it that will actually get those mosquitoes up and active at night to control those daytime biters. Uh, the product that was used down in Miami was a product called Duet, and they have language on their label that says certain mosquito species, such as Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, are most active during the day. So we know that it's going to help control those mosquitoes for us. The reason is it gets those mosquitoes up and active, not in a biting frenzy. So we put more of them out while that spray cloud is in the area. That's what gets us our control. The other good thing about that is that you never want to take you know, a company's word for it. They're always going to speak highly of their products. But with Duet, it was tested by independent people that don't have any monetary value. There's no horse in the race. So the Public Library of Science, the Journal of the American Mosquito Control Association, and the Journal of Medical Entomology all tested that product and found that it does have that, that agitation, that enhanced control that other products don't have out there. So in summary, remember the basics. That's really what we're still going to be dealing with here in Ohio this year. It's the basic mosquito control, the basic services that you guys have provided for many, many years. Okay, we'll be dealing with nuisance and West Nile virus. So think about your basic controls and make sure that you're ready for that season. If you are concerned about Zika, again, what did we learn here today? Okay, don't panic, but be prepared. Know that they're container breeders. Know where you need to go to look for those mosquitoes. It's going to be around the homes. That's where they're going to be. You're going to need boots on the ground. Your larval control, you want to have at least a 30-day residual product that you're using. And if you're going to do your adult control, remember, they feed during the day have a product that has an agitation quality to it. So in summary, plan and prepare, don't panic. Know that your traditional control is still very, very important for Zika, but you may need to just add a couple things 
and do a couple things a little bit differently for Zika if it were to come to pass. Basically, if you have any questions, ask us for help. That's what we're here in the industry for. We'll help you out anytime you can. All right, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.